Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time and for those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us. So there's a story from the 1880s about the Mudville baseball team. And maybe you've heard of this story. Uh, Things were not looking good for the Mudville baseball team on this particular day. They were going into the ninth inning, and they were down four to two. And their star batter was fifth in the lineup, which meant they would have to get through almost half of their lineup before this guy had a chance at making a big play, and people weren't hopeful. And so the first two guys who are in the batting order get up to the plate And hope surges through the stadium as these two guys both make contact with the ball. And it seems like there's going to be a chance that they will get on base and there will be hope. But both of them are thrown out at first. first, And people are like throwing in the towel. We're done. Because the next two batters in the lineup were the weakest two hitters on the team. And surely one of them was bound to get out. And there was no chance of Casey, the star player, getting to the plate. But to everybody's surprise, these next two batters both make contact with the ball. They both find themselves safely on first and second. And now, all of a sudden, there's a stir amongst the crowd because Casey is finding his way to home plate. And this is the rest of the story. Then, from 5,000 voices and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley and it rattled in the dell. It knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat for Casey. Mighty Casey was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped up to the plate. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on his face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt, t'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eyes, and a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood there watching in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches filled with people, there went a muffled roar, like a beating of storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a subtle smile, Kate sees great visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult, and he bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew, but Casey still ignored it. The umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and echoed, answered, fraud. But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey would not let the ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere and somewhere Hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. For mighty Casey has struck out. Many of you probably recognize that that's a poem called Casey at the Bat. It was actually written in 18. 18- 88. And so much has been done with this poem over the years. It's been recited on stages like this. It's been turned into cartoons for kids. And there's dozens of illustrated kids' book, books published 
with this poem in. And oftentimes, when Casey is depicted visually, he's depicted as this huge guy, this muscular guy who's got like shoulders the size of watermelons and like big two by four sort of forearms. And he just is like this big, huge guy. And everything in this poem at some level leads you to believe that Casey is going to be the hero in this moment, right? Right? Even up to the last stanza, it says that somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. Somewhere, somebody, yes, there's joy. The band is playing somewhere. Somewhere hearts are light and somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout. But it's not happening in Mudville because Casey has struck out. And this poem is often used to teach kids a lesson that we should not be overconfident. We should not be filled with pride. And even in one children's book, there's an illustration as Casey's at the bat receiving that first pitch. He stands there with his bat kind of just resting on his shoulder, disinterested, checking out his hands, essentially communicating, I'm too good for that pitch. Like, I'm better than that. And you see this play out all over the place, right? It's often used to teach children the lesson that pride comes before the fall, and it's because we see that lesson learned in so many different areas of life, so many spaces where you see leaders who are overconfident, prideful, and haughty fall because they think too highly of themselves. You even see it in the church, I would say the last 10, 15 years, there's been story after story after story of leaders in the church who think too highly of themselves and then make some mistake that destroys their ministry and they're left doing something other than leading a church. I actually have a a note on my notes app on my phone that I've titled The List that I, you know, put people on there who have had moral failures. As a reminder to me, don't be that person. And I think at some level, we all have to wrestle with, like, how? How is it that I can guard against being somebody who is filled with pride, overconfident, and has too lofty view of myself so that I can be faithful in my walk with the Lord and not stumble and fall? And our passage today in Romans 11 answers that question. It answers how we can be people who actually live into a humble posture rather than an overinflated view of ourself. And this is how the passage begins. This is Romans 11, starting in verse 11. Paul writes, again, I ask, did they, they being Israel, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Now, we're in this section of Romans, Romans 9 through 11, where Paul is talking about how Israel has repeatedly rejected God over and over and over. And the question that Paul is asking is, have they rejected God so many times that now God is in fact rejecting them? And Paul answers, no, not at all. They have not stumbled so far beyond being able to be reached by God because, as he says in verse 6 in this chapter, God's grace is greater than their rejection. And so we're in this section now where Paul is starting to describe, though, what has happened in light of Israel rejecting God. And he goes on to say this. He says, rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. See, God's plan for Israel, is that they would be, have been, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. You see that used in Isaiah. Isaiah talks about that. You actually see that in Luke 1 and 2, talking about the birth of Jesus, that Israel was supposed to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. God intended to bless Israel so that through them, the entire world could be blessed. But because of their repeated rejection, God is now moving forward with his plan in spite of Israel. Meaning he's going to do the things that he's going to do even in spite of Israel repeatedly rejecting him. Which is wildly good news. Wildly good news. Because what that means is that God's plan of salvation is not foiled by our failure. 
that God is going to do what he has set out to do, bring redemption and salvation to the entire world, regardless of whether or not the people he has invited to participate in that plan are actually being faithful in that plan. He is going to do what he has set out to do, and there's nothing that can stop it. Not even our failure, not even our sin, not even our own rejection of him. And he says that his intention isn't to leave Israel behind, right? They've rejected him. God's plan still moves forward. He brings the Gentiles into the family, and he does it with the intention, he says, to make Israel envious. Now, usually we think of envy as a sin, right? It shows up on different sin lists in the New Testament. There's places where Paul will talk about the acts of the flesh, and envy is usually on one of those lists as a way to say, avoid envy. Envy is not good. And so it raises the question, does that mean God is intentionally trying to provoke Israel to sin? He's trying to provoke envy. He wants to make them envious of what the Gentiles have. Now, usually envy surfaces when we see that someone else has something or finds themselves in a situation that we can't have. They have something that we can't have. They're in a situation that we are not in. And so we look at what they're experiencing and we think to ourselves, oh, I want that. How do I get that, right? Envy usually surfaces when we see someone else experiencing something or have something that we don't have. Like I can remember about 10 years ago, it was summer, we were at the pool and hanging out with our family, and there was another guy from our church who was also at the pool with his family. Now, our kids at this point were four, two, and just under one. And this guy was there. We said hi to him. We greeted him, chatted for a minute. We went to our side of the pool. He went to his side of the pool. He was there with his family. His kids were 10, 12, and 14. And I remember at one point, I look across the way, and he's just lounging in a chair, having a fantastic time. He's got his earbuds in, listening to something. He's got a book that he's reading. He's drinking something. Every once in a while, he takes his earbuds out. He, like, you know, talks to his kids from across the pool. He puts them back in and just goes back to enjoying himself. Me, on the other hand, I'm on the other side of the pool, just, like, keeping the kids alive. Don't die. Don't fall in the pool. Just keep going over this way. Somebody's jumping into the pool without supervision, without their floaties on. Somebody has to go to the bathroom. Somebody needs their diaper changed. We've lost one kid. Where are they? Like, the whole goal of that pool trip was keep the kids alive. Don't let them die. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, people have been there before. Many of you are still in that stage of life. And I remember seeing this guy on the other side of the pool thinking like, I want that in the worst way, right? Now, but here's the difference between what I experienced then, what Paul is talking about with the Gentiles, and envy being a sin is that when envy is a sin, it usually is combined with anger. It usually is combined with resentment and bitterness and some measure of covetousness and jealousy, right? There's something in you that's deeper than just like, oh, that would be nice to have. It's like, oh, I'm owed that thing. And so Paul isn't saying that God wants to provoke the Israelites to sin so that the resentful and bitter against the Gentiles... He wants them to see that the Gentiles have something that they should also want. The other distinction between what I was experiencing in that moment and uh, what Paul is trying to talk about here with the Gentiles and the Israelites is that at some level, envy looks at something that someone has or an experience that they have that you, for whatever reason, maybe can't have. But what Paul is saying here is that the thing that the Gentiles have is readily available, not just to Israel, but to everyone. Like God is trying to get people to receive the thing that he's giving. So it's not as though the Gentiles 
have something that Israel can't have. They have something that God, in fact, wants to give to Israel. He wants to bring people into his family. He wants to extend his grace and salvation. And he wants us to live in a way so that people who aren't followers of Jesus can look at our lives and be like, oh, there's something distinct about them. There's something different. There's something attractive. They have something in their life that I don't have, and I'm curious about what it is. And not only that, but God wants us to live in a certain way and communicate to these people, to the world, that they, in fact, can have what we have. It's not something exclusive. It's not something reserved for those who are on moral high ground. It's for anybody and everybody who is willing to surrender their life to Jesus. It is available to all. And so the question for us is, are we living our lives in a way that the world sees what we have and they want it and they're curious about it? And are we communicating to them, living in such a way where we are saying to them, it's yours for the taking because Jesus is open to all. Now, Paul will go on to say, there will come a time. There will come a time when Israel, like, ah, they come back and they realize and they receive again what God has offered. This is what he says in verse 12. But if their transgression means riches for the world, because Israel has rejected God, God has extended his salvation to the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much more greater riches will their full inclusion bring. Meaning, if good came from Israel's rejection, how much more good in the world will there be when they receive what God is trying to do? Now, as we move into these next few verses, 13, 14, and 15, Paul is going to say the exact same thing. He's going to repeat almost the exact same ideas, but the difference is going to be he is going to specifically name and call out the Gentiles, right? He says this in verse 13, I'm talking to you Gentiles. Let me be explicitly clear. Gentiles, I am talking to you. Now, one of the things that's helpful to us for us to remember is that the book of Romans isn't a spiritual dissertation on salvation. Rather, it's a letter from Pastor Paul to a church in the city of Rome. And it's a church that is a small church, probably about 100 people at this point in the world's history. And Rome would have been about a million people. And it's thought that there were no other Christians in Rome at this point in history apart from those 100 people. That's less people in this room in a city about the size of Milwaukee. It was like it would be like if we were the only followers of Jesus in our entire city. A lot rides on their witness. And they're a church that's made up of Jews and Gentiles, Jewish Christians who have realized that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And then Gentile Christians who grew up not knowing nothing of the Jewish faith, but have heard that Jesus is king and have realized that he's a much better king than Caesar is king, so I want to follow Jesus and his kingdom. But the problem with this church is that they're divided. And the dividing line of this church is the Jews versus the Gentiles. The Gentiles versus the Jews. Because each has this sense of superiority over the other. It's as though Gentiles, or excuse me, Jews were thinking like, hey, we're the original people of God. We are the original chosen ones. We are the ones who God said, I want you, so therefore that makes us superior and better. And then the Gentiles are believing, well, you guys obviously couldn't get it right. Like you rejected God over and over so much so he had to bring us in to fulfill his purpose in the world, so therefore we are in fact better. And so each group is at odds with each other, thinking that they are better than the other group. Now, in this moment, Paul is specifically speaking to the Gentiles. At other times in Romans, he has specifically spoken to the Jews, but here he's saying, okay, now I am talking to you Gentiles. And this is what he says. In as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry, in the hope that I may arouse, somehow arouse my own people, right, the Israelites, to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Again, 
Exact same ideas from verses 11 and 12. And again, still speaking to the Gentiles, he goes on to give two quick object lessons. He says in verse 16, If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So he gives these two object lessons. A batch of dough and a tree with its roots. Now, for whatever reason, he quickly leaves the batch of dough object lesson behind, and he starts to develop the tree and its roots object lesson. And he says this in verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, here's his point, Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. So the picture here is an olive tree, which represents Israel. And the underlying assumption of this object lesson is that this olive tree is not doing well. This olive tree, which represents Israel, is withering, it's dying, it's not producing fruit, it's not doing well. And when a tree stops producing fruit, you have one of two options. Either you cut the tree down and you get rid of it, or you attempt to nurture it and revitalize it. And what horticulturists do, one way that they revitalize trees is they graft in new branches. Now, l- l- let me be clear. Like, I'm horrible with plants, right? So I have had to hop on YouTube. You can learn anything on YouTube throughout the course of this week to learn how you do this. Like, I have a plant in my office, and the only reason it's alive is because Veronica waters it on a weekly basis. If it was up to me, it'd be dead, right? But what they say in keeping a plant alive through grafting is you take a branch from a healthy tree. And if you take that branch and you cut the bottom of it into like a V shape, you can then take the tree that's not doing well, the unhealthy tree, and you can see in this picture, you you cut a slit into it, and then you can stick on either side healthy branches from other healthy trees. And you have to line up the edges so that the edges are flush. And then the next step would be to wrap this plastic wrap around it, which creates a little bit of a greenhouse effect. Then sometimes there's other sealants you can put on the tree. You can put moss on the tree. The idea is to keep the tree warm so that the sap from the healthy branch can somehow revitalize the sap from the dying branch and actually bring it back to life. So in this object lesson, Israel is the dying tree. And the grafts, the wild olive shoots, are the Gentiles. And as you might expect, it would be easy for the Gentiles to think, like, yeah, we're keeping this thing alive. You guys did not do a good job. You were dying before we came along. And so, yeah, pat ourselves on the back for doing a good job for keeping this Jesus movement going. And Paul says, well, if you do, meaning if you think that way, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Meaning there's something greater than the graft that is actually keeping the whole thing going. And there's debate, and when we're talking about the object lesson, does the root refer to God? which would make sense because God is the one who's the sustainer of life, or the root could refer to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And some people wonder that because if you go back to chapter 9, verse 5, which is the beginning of this section, Paul mentions the patriarchs, and this could be a callback to that. Either way, what Paul is trying to say is that there is something or someone who has gone before you. There is something or someone that is bigger than you that's actually sustaining all of life. Even though you're a graph that is intended to bring health to the whole thing, he's trying to say a lofty self-perception loses sight of salvation. A lofty self-perception loses sight of God's salvation. 
that it is God who is the one who ultimately sustains life. It is God to whom we all surrender our lives to take control of it. He says this in verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Essentially, I'm in a good spot. I'm doing okay. They were dead. They were broken off. Now I'm okay. Granted, Paul says in verse 20, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith, meaning you didn't do anything to contribute to this. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Meaning, it's just as easy for you who have been grafted in to lose your way and reject God in the same way the Israels, Israelites did. There is no guarantee. You could easily lose your way as well. He, he's saying a lofty self-perception loses sight of salvation, both in reference to God's bigger plan in the world. Like God is doing something that's bigger than all of us. God's intention is to bring salvation and redemption to the entire world. And nothing can stop that because it's initiated by God. It's driven by God. He's going to invite us to participate in it, but it's his work and he's the one who's the author and finisher of it. So it's all about him. And even our sin, our rejection, and our failure doesn't stop his plan because it's him who's doing it. So Paul is trying to help you see that salvation, God's salvation is bigger than just you. And a lofty self-perception loses sight of the vastness of who God is and the salvation he's bringing into this world. But a lofty self-perception also causes you to lose sight of salvation in a specific way as it pertains to you. Meaning, sometimes we have this belief, like the big takeaway here, is that sometimes we have this belief that we are better than other people. And when you start to incorporate it into a religious spiritual context, it's really easy for us to believe that somehow, somewhere along the way, who I am and what I do that's good has actually contributed to my own salvation. Anybody honest enough this morning to say you believe that? Like the reason why good things happen in your life is because I'm a pretty great guy, you know? And, and God is lucky to have me on his team. He's really, I could have been on anybody else's team, but I'm on his, good for him, right? And I'm a really patient person. And if more people were patient like me, this world would be a much better place, right? I'm generous, I'm kind, I'm a good listener. And so therefore, yeah, like somewhere along the way, like I have really helped God out. And therefore, when I experience good things in life, yeah, I'm deserving of it, right? We put our head on the pillow at night and we say, I got your back, God, right? Like if we're honest enough, we probably somewhere along the way have that living in us because we're really good at making ourselves think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And Paul's whole point here is that, no, like, you are in great need for salvation just as much as anybody else. Like, what the gospel does is it levels the playing field. Paul has gone to great lengths, the beginning part of Romans. If you can recall back to Romans 3, no one is righteous, he says. Not even one. Do you know what that means? It means no one is righteous. That's what that means, right? It's just that plain and simple. Like we all are in need. We all are people who need to submit ourselves to God's grace. And that's what Paul says earlier in this same chapter. In verse 6, he says that we are all people who are in need. He says, if by grace, meaning God's salvation, if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. There's another place in Romans 15, uh, excuse me, um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, where Paul simply says, but by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. It's all God's grace in my life, all of it. And so at the beginning, we said, how is it that we remain humble, have an honest view of who we are in light of who God is, and not think too highly of ourselves? It's by daily reminding ourselves of God's grace, and that it's only by God's grace that I am what I am. The skills that I have, the way that he's wired me, the family into which he's placed me. Like I didn't, there's a whole lot of my life that I didn't choose. I'm just riding out the trajectory of the life that God put me on. And what if you started each day this week looking yourself in the mirror and simply saying, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. All of this is one colossal gift in my life. I think it would change the way you view yourself and view others, whether in the world or in the church. And what Paul is trying to say here is that God's grace is motivated by his kindness. His kindness. He goes on to say in verse 22, Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God to those who fell, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you. Provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. We don't always like to think of God's sternness, but as any parent knows, at times you have to be stern and firm with your kids. You have to set boundaries. There has to be discipline, but that doesn't negate your kindness. You could even say that your discipline and your sternness is an extension of your kindness because it's your way of trying to shape your kids in a way so that they don't ruin their own lives. God's kindness is the motivator of his grace in our lives. And what Paul is trying to say, the way that this passage ends, the way we know that God is kind, is no matter how hard, how often, how diligent, resistant we are in our rejection of him, there is always a way home. There is always a way back to him. He says in verse 23, And if they, again they being Israel, do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, you were cut off an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree. How much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? He, he's saying a lofty self-perception loses sight of salvation. There's nothing that we have done that has brought about God's salvation in our world. It's all His grace. And there's always a way back home. No one is too far gone. No one is too far beyond reach for God's grace to have effect in their life. And I think what Paul is trying to show here, again, is that God's salvation is much bigger than we could ever imagine. The work that God is trying to do is wider, bigger, more vast and beautiful than we could ever believe. Uh, this is a picture of a guy named Sam Van Aken. And Sam is a professor at the University of Syracuse. He's actually an art professor, but he has a background in horticulture. And what Sam has done is he has been able to create a tree of 40 different kinds of fruit on one tree. One tree. 40 different kinds of fruit on one tree. I'm getting looks. People are like, no. Mm -mm. Not possible, right? All stone fruit, which means they have a pit in them, like a peach, a nectarine, cherries. 40 different types of fruit on one tree. All he has done, and it's taken him like three years to work on this project, is he's taken grafts, branches of other fruit trees, and all grafted them onto the same tree. And he's trying to cultivate this in a way so that he can start to plant these around, I guess, somewhere in the state of New York, just to capture people's attention so that their mind can be blown by the different types of fruit on one tree. I mean, I think it's ingenious. It's like if you could sell these, people would buy them like crazy. I mean, it's just mind-blowing, right? And he says when they blossom, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen because you have all these different color flowers all on one tree. 
And then when the fruit starts to come in, it's just like, wait, wait is that a cherry? And a, and a peach? Like, how, you know? And I think this is a beautiful picture of what God is trying to do in the world. He's trying to graft in people into his family so that his family is a beautiful picture of all of humanity, of the way that he's created the entire world. And the reality is the tree does not get the credit for what's happening here. The one who gets the credit is the gardener. And we are all branches on the tree. That's all we are. Put there by God to demonstrate his power, his beauty, and his glory in the world. And so the way that we remain humble and not think too highly of ourselves is by remembering who we are and remembering whose we are and remembering that is the gardener who is cultivating the vineyard that we are a part of to demonstrate his beauty, his glory in the world. And we are just simply people who serve the one who is greater than we are. So may you see that God's plan of salvation is bigger than you could ever imagine. May you trust that no measure of sin, missteps, or failure can stop his redemption from moving forward. And may you know that it's him and him alone who gets the credit for extending his grace to you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the grace and the goodness that you have extended to us. We ask, Lord, that you would revive our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see you in light of who you are, and that we would be able to appropriately see ourselves in light of that as well. We ask, Lord, that we would be good stewards of the, the lives that you have given to us, that we would be able to serve you well, reach out to the community around us, and help them see that what it is that we have in you is also available to them, that they too can take part of the salvation that you extend through your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.